Okay, so uh, I want to comment on three things that are, um, uh, as you know, as you can appreciate, I am not a string theorist, but that are related to other kinds of physics. And I think that there are some points that at, at least will justify why, why I'm interested in, in the subject. So, um, number one. Um, so, I wanted to understand, uh, a way to understand simply the uh, bound to chaos. So, as you know, classically there is no bound to chaos. So, one would ask, uh, how does the h-bar enter into this game. So, uh, one way to introduce a measure of chaos that is quite traditional in, in quantum people is to do a Loschmidt echo experiment. So, what you do is you start somewhere, you evolve, and then if you came back, you would come back to the same place, both quantum and classically. But if you go and then you give a little kick and you come back, then the two trajectories, the outgoing and the incoming, are going to differ by a little bit, which will be amplified if there is chaos. This is what is called the Loschmidt echo context. So you go, small kick, and come back. Now, take any operator, measure it. Uh, you want to see the difference having done this circuit and not having done this circuit. So this is the trace of A squared and the trace of A times A transform. This gives you a measure of how different the quantum or classical situations are before and after. And it has to do with chaos. And indeed, you expect it to go exponentially with the time, independently of who are the operators, which will enter only in the prefactor, and independently of the nature of the kick. This is already a non-trivial statement. The fact that this, you get an exponential that, has, that doesn't depend on anything except the system itself. This is something that was known since, I don't know, some 15 years or something like that. And what is nice about it is that there's plenty of simulations and experiments so that we know that this regime, because of course this does happen only for a regime in time, we know that it exists. Yeah. How, can it be, how can it be completely independent of the operators? So oh, oh, I can tell you why. Because the operator you're doing, or let's say the operator with which you do the kick, is going to give you a kick in some direction, and then this is going to amplify. Now, one, one thing we know about Lyapunov instability is that whatever the initial thing, in the end, because it is chaotic, it samples every possible direction, and it amplifies, at least if you're only if you only care about the exponent, it amplifies in the same way. This is just Pezin's theorem, the existence of Lyapunov exponent. If you take the operator to be the identity operator... Definitely. So you have to... Uh, it depends on the operator. It, it, the re regime in which it is independent of the operator, of course, uh, will, will be hidden. I mean, the times at which something will... this regime will happen. But there is, there is such a regime. That, that, that's the important point. I mean, if the system is chaotic, there is. Oh, you, you will get this, the restriction in a second. Uh, <laughs> promise. Uh, um, so, okay. So now, let me expand uh, this difference. Well, as usual, you expanded the B that was in the exponent came down. This was a kick, blah, blah, blah. And then it takes a line to get to this formula, which is the larkin of Shinikov formula, the four famous four-point function. Okay? Yeah. On the previous slide, yeah. Uh, with Lushman, actually, you get exponential decays, not exponential growth. Oh, no, no, no. Here, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, here what happens, this is zero at equal times, the way I defined it. I agree with you. In the calculation of Lushman, of Jalabert and Pastaski, you get a, a negative. But in this calculation, you get a growth. And look, the, this, when the times are equal, A transform is uh, A, and this is zero. But you do get an exponential growth, and you will see it in a minute. But I agree with you. The usual calculation of Loschmidt echo is you have a lump, you go, you come back, and then the overlap uh, uh, goes down. But the way you do it here, in any case, it takes a line to get from what I wrote to this, the, the, your old friend. Okay, so as... 
was remarked, you want this to be localized, you cannot take the trace of anything. So one way to do it would be, the most traditional one is that the operator A is a lump, is something that has a support in a, in a, in a, in a bounded place in phase space. The other way is you could choose this. You see, you take an operator A with anything smooth, but you multiply it left and right, because you want it to be a Hermitian, by this quarter of the partition function. And this is the choice that uh, Maldastrina, Schenker and Stanford used. So if you plug this inside here, essentially you get their four-point function, up to two-point functions which are not interesting because they just subtract uh, the constants away. Okay, so you, here you see the connection it is, is, I don't know, th this has been implicit in, uh, as far as I remember, Kitayev's talk, he mentions Loshumi Peko. I'm, I'm not being original here, but I think it's a nice way to, a ni way, nice way to see it. Sorry, can we go back? What yeah. is the precise connection with Loshumi Peko? I don't see it. So, you go, you take an operator A, transform it according to this uh, transformation, you see what you're doing. You're going, evolving with T, H, giving it a little kick, it's an evolution with B, and then coming back with minus the Hamiltonian. So if T is zero, and of course B is not there, or, or even if B is there, but th this is a, a very small, uh, A is, is almost the same as a, a transform. If B and T are zero, clearly they are the same. So that this subtraction is going to be zero. As T grows, this is going to modify this transformation, which is the Loschmidt transformation, is going to modify this operator A. And now I'm measuring the difference. I, I me this, is, this is just a kind of scalar product. I'm measuring the difference between the untransformed thing and the overlap between the two. It's unconventional from the point of view of Loschmidt Eco, but it gives you directly Lars Larkin of Shinnikov. I guess that their inspiration must have been something like that. Okay, so um, the bound, as you know, is that this Lyapunov has to be smaller or equal than this uh, quantity. Okay, so um, as you know better than I, uh, it's nice because it's a symptom and uh, a symptom of something. Black holes have this symptom. SYK model has this symptom, so that's the reason I think why it is interesting for you. Uh, okay, this I don't need to tell you. And then the proof is a proof, the, the one that they gave, is a proof that you can follow. It's not hard, it's three, <coughs> three four lines. It's, uh, it uses elementary stuff. Still, I, I, my personal feeling when I read it is that I, I understand each line, but it doesn't appeal to me uh, in a concrete way. So, uh, but that's me. So, I, I wanted to do a model that, where this could be understood, and do semi-classics. So, I, I know that I can have the Lyapunov I like, if I do classics, classical. Okay, what happens when I turn on h-bar? So, okay, I want h-bar small, I want to do semi-classics, but if I do h-bar small, as you see from the bound, uh, the quantity that matters is beta, is beta times h-bar, so evidently b the temperature has to be very low if I want to get something interesting. So I'm forced, if I want to do semi-classics, to go to very low temperature. Now what happens when you go to very low temperature in, in, in a normal system? Well, typically there is a ground state and then you're sitting at the bottom in, in the ground state and you're not doing much. So of course you don't have chaos, but it's not interesting. It's like a, like a crystal, I mean you crystallize your system it just vibrates, it cannot do much more than that. So, you realize already that a potential like this is not going to be interesting. It's not going to violate the bound, but it's going to satisfy it in a trivial way at very low temperatures. So, what you need is a potential that is chaotic. This was mentioned by Dima uh, a minute ago, that you need a potential that has a flat bottom so that you can still move and be chaotic or have a chance of being chaotic at very low temperatures. Potentials with a manifold that is flat, uh, this is traditional for solid state people because when you want to confine electrons in a quantum wire, you do exactly that. You, you make a potential that 
forces you to be on the wire and then along the wire you move freely. Okay? So this is very, very traditional and uh, the natural thing to do is to <coughs> parameterize the bottom of the potential and then care only about that bottom and forget about the rest. So you, you do some you write uh, in coordinates, appropriate coordinates, the manifold, whatever it is, which we will suppose it has more than two dimensions, and in the appropriate coordinates you get a Riemannian uh, form and then you get a thing like this. This is just ordinary C number quantum mechanics on a curved space. So this is going to be our model. This has some, some chance of being interesting because even at very low temperature you can still move here and hence you can go away and be chaotic. Otherwise, okay, so now you quantize this. This, is, this has a history. Uh, amongst other things, one of the most beautiful examples of quantum chaos is a two-dimensional hyperboloid and a particle moving freely on it. It has a very, very long tradition starting with Gutzwiller. Okay, so how does it look like classically? Well, classically, as you probably know, when you have a surface like this and you, you have three particles moving on a surface, they move along geodesics. Uh, so they, they take the geodesic. If you fire the same particle with twice the speed, it will move along the same geodesic, but faster. Okay, so uh, this is what it is. And then the question immediately is, okay, fine, and now I can fire it as, as quickly as I can, and then I can get the Lyapunov I like, because trajectories, if I move faster, will separate faster. These two trajectories in space, they are written on the space, I can transverse them at different velocities. Okay, if I do it very quickly, then this separation is going to grow very fast, and this is the Lyapunov exponent. So, what, wh what stops me from going very fast and having the Lyapunov I like? Classically, nothing. So, here goes the semi-classical calculation I did. You want to calculate this four-point function, the one that came from the Loesch Miteko, if you like, uh, well, you want to calculate it in the uh, semi-classical approximation, so what you do is you plug in Van Fleck formula for the propagators. It turns out that these pieces, the one that contains the temperature, are diffusion, simple diffusion on this surface. You can convince yourself that this operator, the, the free La Laplacian on a, a surface, is just diffusion, but there's very short episodes of diffusion, the way it is scaled, and this is what you get. You get four times the same trajectory and to punctuate it by four diffusion, short diffusion episodes. You do the calculation, it's not hard, it's it, it, tedious but not hard, and uh, what you get is what I'm going to describe without the calculation. <coughs> so without the calculation what you get you can see what you're going to get very easily. So the geodesic deviation written in space, the separation of two trajectories, is uh, given by an equation like this. It's, it's uh, the, the, the separation. This I took, I took it from a textbook in quantum, uh, in, sorry, in, in gravitation. Anyway, the separation is a function of Riemann's tensor, the, the, the textbook. <laughs> Uh, this word, uh, I, 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 no, I pirated it from the web, so I cannot <laughs> tell you about its finance. Equation. <laughs> equation. <laughs> so, yeah, okay, so uh, this is Riemann's test, so it doesn't matter. What you get is that the separation between the trajectories scales exponentially, so it's two, uh, if you want, railways drawn on this manifold that separate exponentially with a characteristic length. What I want to say here, and is important, is that if you do this in n dimensions, this length scales with square root of n. You can convince yourself, but the reason is very simple. A Lyapunov thing is, is an intensive quantity, it's not an extensive quantity. Each coordinate expands, and it expands in the same way. And what you're taking essentially is the maximum of the expansion of all of them. So if you want to do it, uh, and, and because it is divided by the original, the fact that it's n-dimensional doesn't change anything. What does change is that the distance you move to get the same separation is the combined distance in all the coordinates. This is where you get the, the square root of n. 
Believe me, it's true. You have to do a picture and then you convince yourself. But don't you need negative curvature for yeah. this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you want to have a Lyapunov exponent, I should have said this, you do need that somewhere in your space there are bumps with negative curvature. Yes, absolutely. Uh, if not, it's, it's going to be true but boring. Uh, what? Okay, so uh, if you want the Lyapunov, Lyapunov, you have to multiply the speed and divide it by this separation. It's, you're taking the two railways but with faster moving trains. And then it's easy to see that this is what your Lyapunov, Lyapunov is. It scales correctly with size. And then you begin to compare. Let us now, this is what enters the semi-classical calculation. You want to compare this length with the phase space De Broglie length. Now, the De Broglie length is given for a particle, so if I want it for n particles, I have to use Pythagoras theorem, and this is where this square root of n comes from. The fact is, I, let me compare these two quantities, so just to see when are semi uh, quantum effects kicking in. So you compare, I compare, I compare, I just put the things over there. All the two pi's I'm losing on my way, so I have nothing to say about the two pi's, but when you get to the end, this is the comparison that counts. So for this system, but then if you look at the semi-classical calculation, you see this properly, but there is not, no, from the physics point of view, there is not much more than what I'm telling you now, is that this is the comparison and the meaning then of the Lyapunov exponent is very clear. You have trajectories written in this space that separate at a characteristic distance given by this L0, which it's typically something to do with the negative curvature that you have, it's that kind of scale and you have to compare it with the De Broglie length in this phase space. And the meaning of the bound is simply that you cannot scatter along a distance, a wavefront along a distance that is much shorter than the wavelength, which to my mind sounds perfectly reasonable. Okay, so this at least, I don't know, I, I, I'm not saying that it, this wasn't implicit in the literature, it was, but I think that it's a good way to see it, a nice way to see it. So can you clarify <coughs> better the square root of L? Yeah. Suppose I will take uh, Sinai billiard not in two dimensions, in three, in four, five, uh, hundred dimensions. So I would say that my collision time, typical collision uh, in which I start to deviate, will be still uh, the size of uh, the box, uh, velocity, <coughs> Divided yeah. by the size of the book, okay. the dimension will not enter here. Put it this way, put it this way, you want to convince yourself that the Lyapunov exponent is something... The maximal Lyapunov exponent, because... The, the maximal, the maximal, we're talking about the maximal. There is also a notion of Kolmogorov entry. No, 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 no. I, I'm only... Piecing to be the sum of all positive. I know this, but no, I want the maximum. So, the maximum, uh, you want to say that it scales like 1, not like n which is something that is not being proven, proven, but we all believe. So, uh, and it, there are cases where it's not even true, but mostly we all believe. In order that that is compatible with <laughs> trajectories being written in space and transversed at speed, you can convince yourself that in space this has to scale square, that has to scale with n. Because well, depending on how the curvature scales with the dimension. I mean, you're changing from one manifold to another. So. Oh, sure, 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 sure. But my curvature, I keep, I keep it as a parameter, and you will see it in a second. I'm not saying for the moment uh, anything of how. But is how it the Riemann tensor, or, there, or the, the range? If, you, if you trace, of course, you're going the to curvature. I, I keep it order one per degree of freedom. The, the curvature length, I keep it order one per degree of freedom. Yeah, yeah. So it's like Riemann is. Okay. Yeah. So, so what, what is it at the end of the day? What does this mean? Well, this is the semi-classical computation. I've put units into this, so uh, on this side I put the quantity that is bound, h bar, beta, the Lyapunov. On this side I do 1 over the de Broglie length. Okay, so here I'm very classical and I'm getting quantum as I move to here. And uh, this is just 1 over L saying that your quantum Lyapunov exponent is equal to the classical Lyapunov exponent, which is okay for the semi-classical limit. This is what the, my semi-classical calculation confirms, it's not a surprise. Then you go up and then typically this breaks down the moment that this thing becomes comparable with either the curvature or the typical Lyapunov length. They are proportional. 
So once you get here, your wavelength is of the order of the features of your potential, and then you no longer can use a semi-classical approximation. It's not true. And what happens? Well, I don't know exactly what happens. One of the things that was pointed out to me by Levioff is that localization effects appear. So no longer the image of a wave front has any sense. I am not even sure that here the notion of Lyapunov, it's not that the Lyapunov is small, maybe it doesn't even exist. For a Lyapunov to exist, I need an exponential in time, and I, cannot even, I don't even know whether there is one. My feeling is that, and this is what happens in Sachte Fillet, to get something that is interesting up to zero, you, know, you need that your system hierarchically has all the possible lengths. In other words, that it is a critical system. And the, the, you can think of critical opalescence. When, when the system is critical, it scatters light in all frequencies, and this is why it's white, the liquid. So I think that, but this is just blah, blah. Uh, you need to have a complete hierarchy of lengths and uh, hence be critical in order to take m m advantage of all the possible lengths as you go to zero temperature. But that's, um, okay. Yeah. So, does that contradict the idea that if you have a non-extremal black hole, you still expect to have this bound and, right? Sorry, uh, the black hole department, <laughs> I cannot tell you anything. I think the bound, the bound for chaos works... The bound for chaos is true always. And, and it's saturated for any black hole. So you, you, don't need, you don't need to have an extremal black hole. Whereas the non-trivial infrared conformal, you know, sort of yeah, yeah. formulas work only in the near... Okay, world. okay. So what you're saying, if I translate it to my language, is that maybe criticality is not necessary. I don't know. What happens here, to tell you the truth, the only thing is that this guy who comes very nicely with a 1 over t, 1 over... It has to stop. It might either turn round, but one thing that is interesting is it becomes of order 1. Which means that even in a, in a model or in a system you find something of order one but not the bound, don't be so happy about it. It's sort of normal that, to my mind. Okay, let me, let me, now I pass to another thing. If you want to ask some other question, I'm going to make a slight uh, intermezzo on glass theory and then I'm going to come back to something like this. So please stop me if, so a little bit of prehistory, very little just to be able to justify what I'm going to say at the end. So this, Family of models, you recognize this is a Gaussian random thing. These are bosons now. These are C numbers. And because they are C numbers, you have to constrain this somehow so that the, the otherwise this diverges. So one <coughs> traditional way is to make these guys be plus or minus one, constrain them to be. You could add a, qu uh, a quartic or some power to, to keep it that way. Or, more nicely, you can make them be on a sphere. Make them be on a sphere is something that goes, takes you very, very close to the study of tensor models because it's a, a recipe whereby you do not break rotational invariance. So, so it's, it's interesting. Okay, but this tensor, unlike the ones you, we heard yesterday, is symmetric. And if it were not, only the symmetric part would count in any case. Okay, and the quantum version, well, you see it's not a big deal has also been studied. This is 80s. What, why is, is, it, is it interesting? Because surprisingly enough, uh, these models are excellent metaphors of what glasses are. They give you a kind of mean field of glasses. Glasses are made of particles. You don't see any particles here, and there are no particles here. But believe me, and it took 20-something years to be really convinced, these are baby glasses, which you can beat to death, and we know a lot about these. Okay, what do they do? The quantum one, this is a phase diagram, H bar T, so there is a, what I would call a liquid phase, you probably would call it metallic phase, and there is a glass phase. What, what, does, what do I mean by glass phase? I mean that if I start in a random configuration and put the system in contact with a thermal bath at a temperature here, it will never equilibrate. It will take infinite time to equilibrate. Infinite in the thermodynamic limit, time to equilibrate. This is the definition of a glass. In the quantum case, how do you bound eta? Because there was no... 
Uh, in the quantum case, you still put it on a big sphere. Okay, but the Hamiltonian was not on the okay. sphere. Uh, oh, sh sorry, sorry, should have we added. Have yeah, or of course you can do the potential that bounds you there and yeah. square it. Uh, yeah, 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 sure, 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 you need it. Uh, Okay, how do I know that it never equilibrates? Because I write a correlation function, and the correlation function, instead of tending to something, I plot it with different starting times, and as time passes, the correlation time gets longer and longer, and it never stabilizes. So if I start the correlation after an hour, it takes an hour to decay. If I start it after 10 hours, it take, take, takes 10 hours to decay, and so on and so forth. This is called aging. It, it is just telling you that the system is getting more and more correlated with time and with a never-ending process. Okay? This is this region. Are there many states which are almost degenerate? You will, you will have plenty of that in a, in a few minutes. But what I want to say about this is that when we solve this, we could solve this part easily, because there is a fast part, just like in SYK. And then this slow part, has the famous uh, pseudo-reparametrization invariance. It is as pseudo as SYK is, is pseudo. And the difference is that the parameter is not the temperature, the parameter is the age. At what time have you started your uh, thing? Very quickly, just to tell you that this for us was uh, an enemy and not a friend because uh, it, we, 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 would, we were never able to do the matching of which is the good reparametrization that matches the other regime. It is it's an, a formidably hard problem. I am reading your papers because I want to <laughs> see if I can steal some techniques from you to do it. So, but as YK somehow, as I understand, Sajjev, he wants to have not a spin class. He wants to. I'm, I'm coming to this in a second. I am coming to this in a second. Yeah, indeed, this is bad for you and bad for Sajdev and bad for Antoine Georges and so these people. These people wanted to have something that was still a liquid at zero temperature, a metal at zero temperature. And so this is bad because you don't want this, because you want, in order to profit more from uh, quantum nature, you wanted this phase not to be there. So this is not a model that will interest you. I'm telling you this because from the prehistory point of view, there are, it explains why I'm here in part. Uh, we know a lot of things about this reparametrization and it's not the same, exactly the same. This one is in real time, yours is in imaginary time. It is not, the, it has dimension zero, for example, not one over Q or whatever, uh, but we have, and we know some things that you don't see in your literature about this one, but we do not know some very many other things, and, and it's interesting for us. A, 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 a sigma model of the reparametrizations was attempted. I believe, now that I, re, I, I read the Schwarzian one of your literature, I believe that it was incomplete, but it was a very nice try because it, this reparametrization has a physical meaning and plays a physical role here. Okay, this is very quickly, just so that you know, so that you keep it in mind. Maybe, maybe sometime you will have more time to. Now, a model. As you see, this model is not nice for the reason that was pointed out. So, how do I do a model? <coughs> Can I do a model with these glass things that uh, at least is a cousin of SYK, a bosonic cousin of SYK? So, here is my model. You have to construct it by... Um, Le uh, by levels. So you start with the Hamiltonian I did a, a minute ago. Let's put it on the sphere to make it easy. And I consider stochastic dynamics for this. So stochastic dynamics means that I do gradient descent plus a little bit of noise. If the system were not a glass or where it is not a glass, this allows you to go to the Gibbs Boltzmann measure, and uh, this has been studied ad nauseum because this is the one that we use when we want to show that the system I is a glass in this region. Solving analytically this dynamics for that model, for this model, you show that within the glass phase, sorry, the classical version in this case, you can do the quantum too. Uh, it shows you that inside this region, uh, the system never thermalized, ne never thermalizes. Okay, okay. So that's for the moment not what we want. So 
Because you have a Langevin equation, you know that probability, this is classical but noisy, probability is a probability cloud that evolves in phase space, but please do not confuse it, this with a quantum wave function. This has nothing to do with wave functions, this is just your ordinary Fokker-Planck equation for a distribution of probability evolving in phase space. For the moment, I haven't got the model I want to. Is there the synthetic form uh, in front of the... Not necessarily. I didn't put the p-square. You could have put, and then you have... No, the but just for the Hamiltonian evolution, this is <coughs> really gradient? Or? This is really gradient. You could do it symplectic too. You could, you could do both. But, but yeah, but you, in this case, both have been studied. Both have been studied. Uh, yeah, it, it will change. But for what I am doing, it's better to keep it first order derivative. You will see why. OK, so this is the evolution. Now, one thing that perhaps you've seen, it's, it's completely standard, but if you, you have to take my word for it. If you, this is a first, uh, this is a differential equation. It's a Fokker-Planck equation, which gives you the evolution. This and this are completely equivalent. This L is the one that makes your probability evolve according to the ensemble of these trajectories. Okay? So one th if I write P, uh, sorry, if I w write, now the question is, what is the form of L? Well, the form of L is what it is. I can write it for you, no problem. But what you should know now, maybe if you haven't seen it, it's not Im immediately obvious, is that if you change bases uh, but with an Hermitian, uh, sorry, if you change bases with this transformation, this operator can be written like that. And this is the Hamiltonian. And this is the Hamiltonian that I define as my quantum Hamiltonian, which has nothing to do with the quantum version of this one. It is taking the Fokker-Planck operator as, by fiat, a quantum Hamiltonian. Why do I do this? Because I, I will try to convince you that it has a few properties that are what we are looking for. Okay? But the thing is... And conjugated variables. Conjugated variables are the derivative with respect to eta and eta. So, this is... Can you I ask you a question? Yes, you've got this vector field, which is your gradient flow. Yeah. Is your L just a Lie derivative along the um, gradient? The I guess so, yeah. yeah. Uh, but there is noise. I don't know if the Lie derivative has that, but there is some, some noise that allows... Added in, added in with the noise, yes. But you're just preserving probability. You're just preserving probability, indeed. Yeah. So uh, when you change it, it, you get this Hermitian uh, thing. And now notice that the temperature, why do I call temperature Ts? Because it's not going to be the temperature of my model. This is a, now a mere auxiliary parameter. But this mere auxiliary parameter, as you can see from here, plays the role of h bar. There is no h bar in this problem, of course. It's an artificial, completely artificial thing. Okay? And this is what you will recognize if I had put two fermions here, a dagger i, a j. This you would recognize as supersymmetric quantum mechanics of the beginning of the 80s. It's a zero dimensional n equals to supersymmetry, which is a well known fact that stochastic equations are directly related to supersymmetric quantum mechanics. Okay? There's nothing new here. So now, okay, bear with me. Let us consider this model with the H that is here. So this is not the quantum version of this model. This is a very artificial thing I did. And now the uh, evolution under this uh, law of, of this model is something like the imaginary time evolution of this Hamiltonian. About the real time evolution of the, with this Hamiltonian, I have no connection to anything. I mean, I cannot, I, I could call it probably uh, diffusion with imaginary noise, but that doesn't sound very... They are not restricted in principle. Uh, they are restricted because H contains some term that keeps you on the sphere. Because due to square... Yeah, but let's say that you, you have... Okay, you have a term that is strong and that keeps you stuck on the, on the sphere, and you include it in H, and okay. 
Okay, so now what about this model? Uh, this model, we know everything. That's a nice thing. Or, or, or Just to be sure, I almost see the, super, the Q. It, it, this is positive. This is positive definite indeed. It has a zero eigenvalue. With negative. No, non-negative, positive definite. It has a zero. It has a, a normalizable ground state. Indeed, because it means that it's, it's a Boltzmann distribution for the original model. So, uh, so it is the lowest you can get. It means that it doesn't evolve anymore. It's zero, which is the, an old statement that when you map diffusion into supersymmetry, to say that the system equilibrates and has an equilibrium is the same as to say that the supersymmetry is unbroken. Okay, so now uh, what do I know? Well. My original model, the one with the J's, and it would be very, very nice uh, if we could do things like you do, but we know a lot about this, has a landscape that is as follows. It has exponentially many minima, the energy. You can count them. The lower you are in energy, the more stable they are, which is sort of reasonable, they are the more round. As you go up, you, get, you meet on your way more and more and more minima, and you get to a threshold level, uh, uh, this growth is exponential, they proliferate exponentially, up to a threshold level when they are all marginal, and then above that level there are no longer any minima. There are saddle points, but no minima. Almost all of the levels are very close to the threshold level, because I guess that you know this, when something grows exponentially, the crust takes essentially all the, all, all the volume. Uh, so, I don't know, I say I guess you know this because whenever I hear about the, the surface of a black hole, it's, but I don't think, I don't know if this has any significance. Okay, now what do you know from the theory of stochastic uh, whatever is that when I consider my quantum, within quotation mark, Hamiltonian, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the states, now quantum states, the eigenvalues of the artificial <laughs> quantum Hamiltonian and the minima with their fluctuations of the original landscape. In particular, the lowest of the lowest is the equilibrium one, the lowest. So, and uh, all these eigenvectors are related to the phases, the many phases of the original stuff. Now, one thing I didn't tell you is that between these states, the barriers are exponentially large, except for the guys who are very near the threshold, which have a lowest. You can think that you have to go up to the threshold and down to go from one to the other. So, and so the eigenvalues here, you can prove that it's the lifetime, one over the lifetime of these phases. So, uh, because these phases are stable in the thermodynamic limit, their barriers are order n, it means that there is ground state degeneracy because there are many, many, many uh, eigenvalues that are extremely close to zero because their lifetime is exponential in n and this is one over the lifetime. So you have eigenvalues, and this reminds me a lot of the last transparency of Dima, uh, you have a lot of, of things that collapse, although there is no true degeneracy, there is, uh, 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 the spectrum is made of levels that are to first order in the thermodynamic limit, degenerate. And what about this, there, there is a degeneracy, every state not at zero has a partner, at least one. What does that degeneracy mean? Every, ah, sorry, should have said. The full supersymmetric stuff, what you say is absolutely true. And this degeneracy gives you, that's, that's Witten's thing for the Morse theory. But uh, here I am confined to zero fermion subspace because I, this is what relates to the, to the diffusion. But you are free, given that I'm taking the liberty of calling this quantum, you, you are perfectly free to take all the fermion subspaces. This uh, I'm, I'm not describing now, but... Uh, what information sits there? Yes, the, the, the entire Morse theory. So uh, to go from one to its partner is to go to from a minimum to a saddle, and then you get all the Morse inequalities and everything. It's, it's a very good... It's symmetric quantum mechanic, but there is no fermions in the theory. Right? Here, uh, th there are no fermions because I, 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 s I remain at the zero fermion subspace. But you could put them. Well, you have, you you have them because... Uh, 
No, 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 because the total number of fermions is conserved, so I'm free to, 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 to look at the matrix block that contains uh, zero fermions. That's the one that is stochastic. Uh, in a previous life, I, I studied the stochastic <coughs> dynamics in the other fermion subspaces to obtain a method to find barriers, but that's another story. Okay, uh, so now I think I can tell you, this is why I say I know a lot, but really a lot, about this spectrum, because uh, I know almost everything about the distribution of minima and barriers here. I can tell you how many of these go like n to the something, how many of these have e to the minus n, just, just what Dima was saying a while ago. I can also tell you how much they hybridize because the barrier is, gives you an idea of how they tunnel. You tunnel from one to the other, so you can... Do you know if they have a random matrix statistics? <coughs> not here, surely not. Surely uh, not. Uh, not unless you go to uh, the level separations that are exponentially small with the size. There is this trade-off between size and, and different... But we, we didn't actually do the calculation about the level statistics, but I'm sure you can do it uh, at this level, because we know pretty much everything about this. What we... Ah, one more thing that we did calculate is... Now the bad news, or the more or less bad news. Um, so, notice that the system doesn't move in this landscape. It moves in a landscape that is more like this one. So it's the gradient squared. This is why it's positive, no? And this correction term. So uh, that's the effective potential of your system. And, okay, so now you can say, okay, let me take this model seriously and uh, calculate the partition function. Partition function, you can calculate the specific heat, and it gives you a power law, non-trivial power law, but unfortunately it's not one, like you like. Uh, the fermion nature that we don't have here for the, in this version uh, doesn't uh, is the one that is responsible for the one. Here you get 1.5. Uh, but it is a non-trivial exponent. It has a zero temperature critical point in the sense that nothing happens. There is no, I, I, when you do real-time dynamics on this, there is no phase transition up to zero, just like in SYK. The it has, of course, ground state entropy, which is nothing but the number of metastable states that, the log of the number of metastable states that live forever. This is what glass people call the complexity. Uh, because all the metastable states that live forever are flat in their spectrum, which is one over the lifetime, how many of these you have is how many metastable states everlasting metastable states you have. That's a zero temperature entropy. And if you want the temperature, the entropy at a given temperature, the entropy, it is the number of metastable states that have a lifetime that is the inverse of that temperature. Okay, so we are playing with this artificial construction because we know things. Um, now, we tried the real-time dynamics with an eye. Remember that the, 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 the relation between diffusion in the original model came through a Langevin process. And this one mapped to a Fokker-Planck, which is a, a naturally imaginary time thing. If I want to put an eye in the dynamics, this corresponds to nothing, but you can calculate it. At least for Q equals 2, what we get is that there is a time scale that is the temperature squared and not the temperature. So we, it goes to infinity, this time scale, like as the temperature goes to zero, sorry, one over the temperature squared, one over the temperature. So uh, you know that the, the time scale of SYK goes like beta, this one goes like beta squared, at least for Q equals two. We are in the process of calculating it for another Qs, but uh, we haven't done that yet. The equations you get to solve this in real time are, uh, very similar to the ones of SYK, except that, of course, the correlation functions are symmetric, these are bosons, and uh, except that you have three order parameters instead of one. Instead of having one G, you have three Gs, which are related through an internal symmetry, which I could has to do with the supersymmetry of the original problem. 
We have not yet calculated the Lyapunov exponent, uh, but it's doable and we're doing it, so just to see what it gives. So for the moment, the only thing I can say is that you can understand very well the zero entropy, uh, sorry, the zero temperature subspace and what are the, what is their structure. When we'll have a, a Lyapunov exponent, <coughs> if, it's, if we're lucky enough that it is as large as it can be, it would be nice, but we, we will find out. So just uh, to go back to the original stuff, you see that the fact that you need a well that is flat at the bottom for bosonic systems is realized in this model. Here, coming from, let's say, the supersymmetry of the model. And that's all. Only, okay, so why am I interested in these things? Well, first of all, simple-minded elementary results. I think that many of these bounds are elementary results that should be explainable in an undergraduate course, and I think that they should be written in this way. No, not the fact of saturating them, but the fact that the bounds exist should be under undergraduate stuff, and, and, and one has to work to make it such. Uh, then uh, glassy ideas applied to these field theoretical systems, I don't know, but maybe something of interest. It, th this, these models come from the world of, of spin glasses. And, um, and above all, I want to learn some, some of the techniques and, and the things that, are, that you use. So, thank you very much. <laughs> So this, uh, this, this TS temperature that entered in the Langevin equation of your bosonic It's become H-bar of the new model. It will become H-bar, but, but, but more importantly, uh, what is its relation with the parameters of distribution of the J-I? Nothing. You, you have your J's, and then you apply your Langevin equation at a given temperature. Ah, okay, so the J's are fixed once and for all. They're yes, and then I... If you want, you can say that you tune their co common amplitude, but you can say also that you just change the temperature. So the, so the, so the, so the original Hamiltonian H that you wrote for the, for the Q... Yeah. Q uh, Doesn't contain... Is, is not disordered. It, it is disordered. But the J's are a random variable. A random variable, but, but, but their distribution is unrelated to the... It's unrelated. Yeah. Two, so we heard yesterday about the Mellon models and yeah. so on. So could this, the large end limit, be the solution of the Hamiltonian of the Mellon? Well, the Mellon was, and, and this is something that was point out, what pointed out, is that uh, it's J's with, I would put it, if you want, three kinds of, of firm they talk to uh, each index. It's not the same, so this matrix need not be symmetric, and that's where you can do all this beautiful classification. If I understand correctly, one could aim at doing it for symmetric ones, which is the one relevant for us, but it's harder. So, if we get, we are, there are plenty of reasons to want to know more about these models, because they are also uh, toy models of comple comple complexity, of uh, like algorithmic complexity. So if we knew more, we would be more than happy, and it would have more than many applications. So, but uh, uh, the mathematicians know about these things, but doing this with rigor takes, as you know, a long time. And the second question, I, I didn't, can you elaborate on the situation between, you showed the flat ground state, <coughs> on the other hand, your different discrete number of vacua have nothing to do with the flat direction. No, you're so, right. So what is the connection? Well, uh, yes. So let me put it this way. It's, it's as if you had, your potential uh, is the one I drew. It has many minima near the threshold, a few deeper, and a few deeper. Uh, now, this was the original landscape. Now, uh, essentially, the potential of the, let's say, artificial system is something like V prime square plus a small correction. So now, for every minimum, there is, there is zero. For every minimum, you have, and then it has some, between minima, uh, it, it's not zero, zero. However, half of the minima, because this is an exponential growth, live very close to the, to the surface of the threshold and have a very small barrier. 
but it gets smaller as you go up. So have an order one barrier. So, so some of these bumps between, between zero and zero are order one, which is not the same as being zero, but it means that with some temperature you can move. But this structure is responsible, I believe, for the fact that we don't get beta, we get beta squared as a time for, for, for the relaxation of the system. Another question, Gary? If I understand it, your first construction of this path and then back together with a kick was based on uh, a purely classical definition of chaos, yes? Yeah. Uh, I mean, what happens is that when you do the semi-classical calculation, you discover that in the region where this semi-classical approximation works, what you need to compute is four times the same trajectory, back and forth, uh, one time to go, one to come back, one to go, one to come back, and it's the perturbations around these four time bounds that gives you the, 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 four, the commutator. Yeah. But if you want larger h bars, then of course. But my question is, is slightly different. So for any Hamiltonian system, the construction works. The construction works. What you're not guaranteed is that the, you do have a Lyapunov exponent. This, this commutator could give you zero. Now, I like to think of uh, quantum mechanics as classical mechanics. Okay. As long as you have a finite dimensional Hilbert space, then you have a Hamiltonian flow on complex projective space. And so you can translate the, all of the equations into the language of uh, Hamiltonian mechanics. It's a very particular type of Hamiltonian mechanics. So this makes me wonder whether if I used the purely classical language consistently, I would arrive at the same construction. Possibly, but somewhere h-bar has to creep in and tell you, listen, you're not, I'm not allowing you to have the Lyapunov that you want. Well, h-bar would uh, creep in when you start talking about temperature, I think. Because I'm only in interested in the evolution of the states modulo phasing, and, but, but I'm not concerned with their phases. Okay. But, sorry, so I'm a bit confused because I thought that, of course, in quantum mechanics, if you look at the evolution of the state, you never see chaos, obviously, because the evolution equation is the Schrodinger equation, which is linear. Yeah, but I think that this is why I think that as physicists, the nice construction is the Loschmidt construction, which you understand perfectly. But then I'm not sure I understand your point. With their, maybe I misunderstood. Well, this, this, this remark you just made may actually mean that you can't get using the Hamiltonian language to this uh, picture of, of, of Loschmidt. Mm -hmm. Another okay. but I, comment, Sam, for you? Uh, is it possible to see that the, 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 the Yapun of uh, uh, exponential growth is asymptotic, uh, but is it possible to see in these, in, in these systems whether one can actually get to a time scale where the Lapun of growth becomes. exists. Uh, yeah. well. Whether one is dominated <coughs> by situations <coughs> where the system is complex, but one never gets to the asymptotic. Well, this is, this is something that we, we should be able to provide one day. I mean, calculating it and, and see. I think that there's going to be, there is every reason why you can throw the derivative and do part of the same. Only that it's not exactly the same, the correlations are bosonic and so on. But um, you do have things that relax more and more slowly. And the, the, the trick of throwing a time derivative away is in glass theory it's 30 years old and we know a lot. And we have terrible gaps also in this knowledge. But uh, it is something that is important for us because it tells us something very physical about glasses which I can tell you some other day.